All right, it is exactly 10.15, so thank you all for being on time. We'll, uh, we'll get started. So my name is Ben Cassess. I'm the AAS Media Fellow. I'm doing some relief pitching for Carrie this morning, uh, who is assisting us still in the audience, and with Zili Shen, the Astrobytes Media Intern. So it is Tuesday, January 10th. It is 10.15 Pacific in Seattle, and I'm welcoming you to our third press conference of the 241st meeting of the AAS. This session is titled, New Developments in the World of Planets. Uh, so joining me will be four speakers. We have three in-person presenters and one virtual presenter at the end of the session. So uh, first, uh, their speakers will present in order. We're going to hold Q&A until the end of the presentation. Uh, and so, yeah, keep that in mind. Our first presenter will be P Dr. Patrick Taylor. Following him will be Dr. Emily Gilbert. Following her will be Dr. Rob Zellum. And then finally, virtually, will be Dr. Sasha Hinckley. So with that, I will turn it over to our first presenter. And thank you very much. Is it on the other screen? Same stuff with two women instead of red. Morning, everyone. My name is Patrick Taylor. I'm the Joint uh, Division Head for Radar at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and Green Bank Observatory. This morning, I'll be presenting on the Next Generation Planetary Radar on the Green Bank Telescope on behalf of GBO, NRAO, and our colleagues at Raytheon Intelligence and Space. So GBT has been involved with radar since its inception more than 20 years ago, but it's always been used as a radar receiver. Some of the first science that was ever done with the GBT was as a radar receiver. And most recently, the GBT was involved in confirming the success of the NASA DART mission that uh, recently impacted into an asteroid and changed its orbit. So what we want to do now is use the GBT as a transmitter. There's several reasons we want to do that. Obviously, GBT is a 100-meter telescope, so we have a huge aperture we can use. That translates to a lot of antenna gain for transmitting. The GBT has an extremely smooth surface, so high surface accuracy, which also translates to higher gain and the ability to go to higher frequencies. And it's also fully steerable, so it's very maneuverable to look at targets on the sky. So what we did was we put a prototype transmitter on the GBT, and this was a transmitter built by Raytheon, mounted at the prime focus of the GBT, and GBT transmitted to the target, and then the echoes were received by the 10, 25 meter very long baseline array uh, antennas. And this was very low power. Its peak power was about 700 watts. So that's comparable to a household appliance or a bunch of light bulbs. So it was not a high power system, but it was still able to achieve range resolutions in these images of order one meter. So we did test observations in late 2020 and early 2021, looking at the moon, space debris, and a near earth asteroid. And on your left, you can see an example of a spotlight radar image. Spotlight because the illumination there is literally the radar beam on a section of the, the lunar surface. This is the area around the Apollo 15 landing site. And the, you can see the viewing geometry is changing due to the motion of the Earth, the Moon, and their respective rotations. So if you take that animation, instead of having an animation, you turn it into a single image you get something like this. This is the Apollo 15 landing site with a resolution of 1.25 meters. This is the highest resolution image of the moon ever taken from the ground, so from Earth. So we have other examples. Uh, this is Tycho Crater on the moon for sense of scale. It's 85 kilometers across. The resolution in this image is five meters per pixel. And if we, we can zoom in a bit on the crater floor and hopefully you can see that there's uh, sort of linear or polygonal features on the, the crater floor, just showing that you could start doing geology with these images from the ground. So 
Another thing we did was look at a near-Earth asteroid. This is an asteroid called 2319372001 FO32. But it, <laughs> alphabet soup, but it's it's defined as a potentially hazardous asteroid. And I put that in quotes because potentially hazardous is a definition based on size. In this case, it's about one kilometer in diameter and how close it can get to Earth, how close its orbit can come to Earth's. So that can define it as potentially hazardous. But I just want to... to be clear that this object has no impact threat to Earth. So don't let the name uh, fool you too much. So back in 2021, it flew by the Earth at about 2 million kilometers away. And that's a quite a close approach for an asteroid this size, but that makes it a very good radar target. So we used the prototype radar to look at it. And even though it was uh, a very low power radar system, we were still able to detect the asteroid. And it might not look like much in the plot in the bottom left, but that spike there is the asteroid. And, you know, it's not a, a, the same as the images of the moon, but from that little spike, you can figure out how fast this object is moving. You can figure out its orbit. You can figure out its uh, trajectory in the future. You can determine its impact risk. You can assess how much of a hazard it is. You can uh, constrain its spin state, its size, its composition, its scattering properties and so on. So even though it doesn't look like much, that one little detection can tell you a lot of information about the characterization of the asteroid. So the main takeaway from this though, is that we were able to, de to detect an asteroid five times further away than the moon with less power than your microwave oven, which is pretty impressive. So what we wanna do next is we want to be able to scale this up a lot. Our goal is to have a high power radar. This prototype was 700 watts. We wanna go up to 500 kilowatts, so a factor of a thousand more powerful. And when you do that, you expand your reach into space, you expand the volume that you can search and survey. And with that, you can study more objects in more detail at higher resolution. So with the prototype, uh, we were able to share some pretty compelling results uh, with these four bullet points. Uh, so first, I, you saw with the high resolution images, even a low power radar system on the GBT is capable of meter scale images of the moon, which can translate to geological studies and also constraining dynamics because radar is very sensitive to the relative motion between the earth and whatever target you're looking at. So this could be very compelling to study uh, sort of the small scale dynamics of the, the moon's rotation. And if we can do meter scale imaging of the moon, you can also do very high resolution uh, monitoring, tracking, and uh, characterizing of things that are closer than the moon. So in this case, we want to be able to use a, this radar to study space debris in cislunar space. There are a lot of facilities that can do debris in low Earth orbit, but not many can do high Earth orbit or cislunar space. And as we're advancing to send humans back to the moon, it's going to be a concern for safety and security of what's out there between the earth and the moon and whether it can pose a threat to astronauts or other spacecraft. And I also showed that we can detect near earth asteroids. A high power system means you have more reach. You can see more asteroids further out into space. You can characterize more of them to study their uh, Physical and you can do physical and dynamical characterizations of them and also evaluate whether they are impact hazards. And if you were to find something that is an impact hazard to Earth, you would want to know when it's going to make an impact and uh, the properties of it so you could send a mitigation mission. And if you want to mitigate an impact, you want to know about that as with as much warning time as possible and you want to know as much characterization information about the object as possible. And that's something that can be provided with a high power deep space planetary radar, like the one we want to put on the Green Bank Telescope. Thank you. Okay, so look good. Hey everybody, my name is Emily Gilbert. I'm a postdoc in the Exoplanet Exploration Program Office at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. 
And today I'm going to be talking to you about an exciting test discovery in a familiar system. So just a brief refresher before I begin. Uh, back in 2020, we announced the discovery of three planets orbiting TOI 700, TOI 700 B, C, and D. And TOI 700 D is TESS's first Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone around TOI 700. A little bit about the host star TOI 700. It's an M2.5 star with a temperature of around 3,500 Kelvin. It's about 40% the mass and radius of the sun. And it's a quiet, slower rotating star. And so we believe that the star is older than 1.5 billion years. It's at a distance of just over 31 parsecs or just over 100 light years. So using test year one data, we were able to validate three planets in this system. These planets ranged in orbital period from 10 days to 37 days and radii from around one to 2.6. So TOI 700 is in the test Southern continuous viewing zone. So in the first year of data, we got 11 sectors of observations of TOI 700. So here you can see in this lovely animation made by Ethan Cruzy, we had the first year of data, test flipped and observed the Northern hemisphere in the second year of observations, and then went back to the Southern hemisphere and filled in some of the gaps and reobserved the Southern continuous viewing zone. So with this additional 10 sectors of observations, we were able to revise our initial planet fits. So here are the initial parameters from our paper that we put out in 2020. Then here you can see the revised fits with the new data, plus some upgrades to the test data processing pipeline. So planet B got a little smaller. It's now about 90% Earth's radius. C stayed close in size, and D went down to 1.07 Earth radii. And with this additional year of data, we made a very exciting discovery. We found a new planet in the system, TOI 700E. Uh, it's nestled in there between planets C and D, so I'm very sorry that they're not in alphabetical order. Planets in the system go B, C, E, D. Uh, but because of the small size of this planet, it's 0.95 Earth radius, uh, and the way the transit times fell, we really needed this additional year of test observations in order to detect this planet. So following in the footsteps of TOI 700D, TESS's first Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone, TOI 700E is TESS's second Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of its host star. So here are just a few stats about this new planet. It has an orbital period of 27.8 days. It's about 0.95 Earth radius. And at this size, this planet is likely rocky. It receives about 1.3 times the amount of starlight that Earth receives from, it, from the sun, and this places it within the optimistic habitable zone. So here you can see a system overview figure to help you visualize this. Uh, so planet E is orbiting up top in what we call the optimistic habitable zone. And so this is expanding on the traditional or conservative habitable zone to account for the fact that we believe Mars and Venus once had liquid water on their surfaces. So here you can see transit data from just a single transit. Uh, and I've binned the data a little bit for uh, visual purposes. And you can see why we really needed additional data in order to detect this planet. So with each frame that we go here, uh, I include another transit. And over time, we slowly build up enough signal to detect this transit. So it took 14 total transits, seven in year one of test observations and an additional seven in year three. Uh, but we were able to finally discover this new world. So I just want to talk about some significance of this discovery. Uh, one thing that's really great about TOI 700, the host star, is that it's bright and nearby and relatively inactive, so it's a good target for additional follow-up. Furthermore, we know that these planets formed under the same initial conditions. They formed around the same star from the same disk, so this enables us to study how different planet traits may affect planet habitability. So traits like the boundaries of the habitable zone or the planet size, because we have a slight difference in between the size of planet E and planet D. And I'd just like to conclude here by thanking all of the lovely co-authors who have contributed to this work. This was a massive group effort, and I really appreciate all of the work that went into it. Uh, and if you want to hear more about this system, I encourage you to look at the full paper, which should be posted on the archive tonight, that was just recently accepted into AppJ Letters. Thank you very much.
us. Hey folks, welcome. Thanks for coming out today. In case of those who are playing WS Bingo, someone wearing a Hawaiian shirt <laughs> and Kilt Guy is over there so you can get two squares for this one session. <laughs> So I'm Rob, I'm at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and today I'll be talking about Exoplanet Watch and announcing literally right now the general audience launch of our project. And Exoplanet Watch is a citizen science project to monitor transiting exoplanets. For the last few years, we've had a limited launch towards amateur astronomers and professional astronomers. And now we're announcing today right here that anyone and everyone can truly participate in this project and learn directly using real data analysis tools, how exoplanet science is really done. So just in case you forget, a transit is when you're looking at a host star, and if you're lucky enough, that star has a planet orbiting around it. And if the geometry is just right, that transit will pass in front of the star, causing the star to appear to dim, and that shadow is cast all the way out here on the Earth. And this method is really important because it allows us to characterize the atmospheres of the planets themselves. We can figure out their molecules, their thermal structure, and their atmospheres as well. And this method has been used extremely successfully currently with the Hubble Space Telescope, with the James Webb Space Telescope, and future missions such as Ariel's uh, European Space Agency's Ariel mission is a dedicated mission that will be looking at the atmospheres up to a thousand exoplanets. But in order to observe a transit with any of these space-based or even ground-based telescopes, we have to know very precisely when those transit events occur. If there's an uncertainty of when that event will occur, that's additional observational overhead we have to build into our observing campaign. And honestly, at the end of the day, that's not a very efficient use of these very precious resources. Everyone, rightly so, wants to get on Hubble and James Webb and large ground-based telescopes. So in order to maximize their efficiency, what we're doing at Exoplanet Watch is we're leveraging many small telescopes routinely operated by small colleges, universities, amateur astronomers, citizen scientists to observe these transiting exoplanets, update their transit times so then we can more accurately predict when that next event will occur so we can use these resources a lot more efficiently. And that's what started Exoplanet Watch, a citizen science project to monitor transiting exoplanets. And by participating in this project, anyone and everyone can join. I'll be talking a little bit more about that later, but you can directly enable NASA science through this project. Um, we're a collaborative effort meant to um, complement existing surveys. All of our data is immediately public. There is no proprietary phase. You can go onto our website right now and grab any of our data or data products off. You can scoop us. Yes, I'm giving you permission to scoop our work. Just cite our paper and give us an acknowledgement. That would be much appreciated. Um, we also have target requests by professional astronomers. We actually had two very successful campaigns at the end of 2021 and saved actually up to, I think, two hours of James Webb time for an upcoming observing campaign. One thing I'm very proud of is that observers will be listed as co-authors. So if you contribute a light curve and it's published for the first time, we're requiring and requesting that the lead authors include you as a co-author. If you do the work, you deserve the credit. And also have to give a mention that we're part of NASA's Universal Learning. So a big shout out to them for supporting all of our work over the last few years. So as a citizen science project, we have two overarching goals. We have our educational goals and our science goals. And at the end of the day, our education goals, what we're really trying to do is not only demonstrate how science is done and have people directly part of the scientific process and enabling as a NASA science, but also to help inspire the next generation of astronomers or at least STEM uh, learners as well. And by doing this, we're achieving really amazing science goals, such as, as I talked about before, ensuring the efficient use of large telescopes. We also have the capability and are starting to discover and confirm new exoplanets. And we can also monitor for stellar variability, which is really important for interpreting the data taken by Hubble and James Webb and other telescopes. So here's an overall map of our user experience. I'll step through this in a second because I haven't had enough coffee yet to understand this yet myself. So let's say you're an amateur astronomer, you have your own telescope. What you do is you hop on our website, you go to one of our portals on there through the Swarthmore Transit Finder, and you can actually get the recommended targets for your exact location on the Earth and give you all the information on how to observe it. You can also observe any transiting exoplanet that you want. We'll take data from you no matter what. 
And then here's a picture of Brian Martin, one of our uh, amateurs, and he's very proud to hopefully observe with his cloud filter. It looks a little cloudy out there uh, for Exoplanet Watch. But if you don't have your own telescope or you don't uh, go to a university that might have their own telescope and digital camera, it's not a big deal. You can still fully participate in this project because literally two weeks ago, we published a new data checkout system. If you go on our website, you enter your email, prove you're not a robot by selecting stop signs in the capture sort of thing, and then you can get data from one of our partner observer to observatories. Here's a picture of the Micro Observatory. It's an uh, autonomous six-inch telescope out in Tucson, Arizona, operated by the Micro Observatory at DIY Planet Search. And they have very, very kindly donated to us over 10 years of data, about 2,000 light curves. So hopefully that will get us through at least the end of the week, hopefully. We also have a few telescopes out at Table Mountain, which is a facility run by JPL. We have a 0.4 meter telescope that will hopefully be coming online after all the rains pass through SoCal a 0.6, and occasionally I have access to one meter. In other words, we have a lot of telescopes. We're trying to always get more data back, but then professional astronomers can come to us, and I can guarantee them, if it's not cloudy in SoCal and it's not raining for the one day a year in SoCal, uh, that we can actually observe their targets for them. Uh, we have our own data analysis program called Exotic, and uh, lots of folks also use Astro Image J, but you actually do your own data analysis and reduction. So there's no black box here. You're not uploading your data. You actually participate in the data analysis method as well. We have our own reduction code called Exotic that I'll talk about in a second, but you can use whatever you want as long as it's in the right format to upload and contribute to the AAVSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers, their exoplanet database. That's all that matters at the end of the day. And we're really lucky to be having this partnership with the AAVSO because they're hosting uh, all of our exoplanet data. And you sit back, relax. If you're over 21, crack open some beers, you know, maybe, and publish data, be added as co-authors, or even publish your own paper using any of our data products. I talked very briefly about Exotic. This is our exoplanet transit interpretation code. This is literally the same code that we use as professional astronomers to analyze our data. And we've made it through a portal in the Google Colab cloud easier for the general public to interact and use that same exact tool that we use to publish data, especially this light curve right here, to um, to analyze your own data. And this is teaching folks how science is done. We also have amazing step-by-step -step tutorials on how to run it. And you can run this all through your smartphone or even your Chromebook. So you don't even need a fancy computer. You just run it all online. I mentioned very briefly earlier that we had a big observing campaign of December 2021. This was of a transiting exoplanet called HG 80606b, and we had a worldwide campaign to observe this transiting exoplanet. It has such a long transit duration, it was, near, it was impossible for any single user to observe it. So we combined all of our users together, started off in Asia, then India, then uh, out to Europe and North America, and back to some folks in Japan again to observe this transit combined all that data together, and thanks to their efforts, we're saving a few hours of James Webb time on some observations that'll hopefully be upcoming soon. So I'll leave you here. This is our uh, QR code on the left is to our website. I have a hard time memorizing QR codes, so just Google NASA Exoplanet Watch. We also have a workshop coming up that's free uh, through the Micro Observatory, and we'll be stepping through the entire process on how to uh, participate in this project, and that's the QR code on the right. And with that, thank you so much. Okay, if you can go ahead and share your slides. Okay, are you able to see those slides there? Yes, we uh, we can see them. Okay, and you can hear me okay? Yes, you sound okay. Yes. Okay, I'll get started then. Okay. Um, Hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm over in the United Kingdom right now, so it's very dark and rainy here. 
Uh, maybe it is as well in Seattle, but I'm going to tell you uh, about uh, a new discovery of a, a new exoplanet here uh, called HD 206893C. And I'm going to raise the provocative question and ask, is this the first directly Gaia imaged, uh, directly imaged Gaia exoplanet? I should introduce myself and say that I'm Sasha Hinckley. I'm an associate professor here at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm originally from the United States, though. My contact information is there uh, on the first slide, and I'm going to be presenting this work, which is published uh, on the archive. Uh, and there is a link uh, right there in front of you, but I'll also post that in my presentation uh, later. So the area that I work in is actually the direct imaging of exoplanets. I think most people in this room know about the ubiquity of exoplanet discoveries in the last several years. The area I work in, we try to actually resolve exoplanetary systems, both through a combination of hardware and software. We block out the very bright host star light uh, and try to resolve these exoplanets orbiting around them. And my colleague Jason Wong and Christian Marwa have made this nice movie where we can actually witness planets orbiting around their host star. In this picture, the host star is located at the center of this field of view, blocked out, as I said before. The key thing to take away from this image is that the planets we have traditionally been sensitive to are nothing like the planets in our own solar system. This little bar at the bottom of this slide is 20 astronomical units, 20 times our Earth-Sun distance. So these planets are on orbits that are comparable to that of our own Neptune or maybe even our own Pluto. And what we'd really like to do is get in close to these stars to understand, to get closer to the populations that have been identified by the transit and the radial velocity methods, because that's where we know a lot of the planets are. So just moving ahead a little bit, one of the targets to go after is the star HD 206893. And this is a particularly interesting system for many reasons, not least of which is this has a very prominent circumstellar debris disk that had been identified both through missions like Spitzer, Herschel, and even Alma. A circumstellar debris disk you can kind of think of as a remnant of the planet formation process. These are boulders and rocks that are colliding and grinding down and making dust. These are the, the sort of parts of planetary systems that aren't contained in planets. So this is a natural place to search for more of these directly imaged planets. And indeed, uh, this was a target from using the European Southern Observatory Sphere instrument. One of the uh, uh, instrument teams went after this target and obtained this image. Again, we see the host star that's been blocked out in the center of the image using hardware and software. And they found evidence for this companion here, which we would call HD 206893b, orbiting at about 10 astronomical units from its host star. So a cartoon of the system, if we look at it in profile, might look something like this, where we have the host star here, we have some belts of debris disk and it of debris, and in these gaps here, we have the presence of this thing that's sort of a brown dwarf, not quite a planet, somewhere in the vicinity of five to 30 Jupiter masses orbiting at 10 astronomical units. But there's something that's a little bit peculiar about this system, and that was identified by ESA's Gaia mission. So just to remind everybody, the Gaia mission is a survey of the brightest billion stars or so. And Gaia's job is to measure the very precise astrometric positions and motions of nearby stars. And Gaia can't actually resolve or, or, or certainly doesn't have the sensitivity to actually image planets. But what it can do is it can infer the presence of planets because of the orbital wobble that they induce on their host star, shown sort of by this cartoon here. I like to think of an athlete maybe swinging a discus the athlete actually wobbles around its center of mass. It's easy to see the athlete, the, the star, but maybe not so easy to see the discus, which is the planet in this analogy. But so astrometry is a great technique for actually searching for exoplanets. And as I'll mention in a moment, Gaia is gonna uncover thousands of exoplanets in the next few years. But the key thing is that precise astro astrometric measurements of this star were not consistent with only one companion. There was strong evidence that there must have been an innermost companion closer to the host star. So we decided to search for this companion. And the tool we use to do that is actually not just one telescope, but it's combining four telescopes together. And these are the four eight meter telescopes that are really the gems of the ESO's very large telescope collection located at the top of Mount Paranal in Chile. The advantage of connecting all these telescopes together to work together is that they operate as one giant telescope, maybe 100 kilometers in size. And our plan was to use this facility to search for the inner planet within uh, this system. 
This is a truly amazing instrument that we used. It's called gravity. This is really one of the most remarkable astronomical instruments that's ever been built. And this is really another one of the gems that's located at the top of Mount Paranal. So the result is that we actually did detect this innermost planet. And just to give you a little taster, this is the image I showed you before from the 2017 paper. And we were able to actually detect this innermost planet here, which is indicated by these red orbits that might be located somewhere here. So let's take a little bit closer look at these orbits and see what we can learn by these. So looking at these orbits a little bit closer, we see this family of blue orbits, and those correspond to the outer companion that was discovered many years ago that I told you about a few slides ago, the B companion. And the blue orbits, the family of blue orbits, are the orbits that are consistent with that astrometry that we've measured here. But what we have now are three individual measurements of this new exoplanet. And if we zoom in a little bit uh, on these orbits, I'll show you here, this is what the positions of these of the, these new measurements of this exoplanet position look like. And I wanna highlight the absolutely exquisite astrometric precision. We can now measure the positions of exoplanets orbiting around their host star with a precision of something like 50 to 100 micro arc seconds. Now you might not be used to thinking in terms of micro arc seconds, but I actually did a calculation and 50 micro arc, se arc seconds corresponds to the size of a United States dime at 60,000 miles. So that's the kind of precision that this incredible instrument is able to achieve uh, on the top of Mount Paranal. The fact that we can measure this astrometric precision so well means that we can measure a mass of this object and we find that it's 12.7 Jupiter masses. And that means it's clearly a planet. So what are the implications of this discovery? Well, in my mind, the thing I'm most excited about has to do with what I call the coming Gaia revolution. So I told you about Gaia a few moments ago, and Gaia is actually going to uncover thousands of planets. And many, many of these are going to be bright enough and young enough and close enough that we can actually directly image them. And this is expected to be the way for my community to actually characterize planets going forward. So Gaia will detect thousands of exoplanets in the next few years. And I believe that this discovery is actually the first directly imaged Gaia exoplanet. So this is really a breakthrough for my field because this is expected to be the, the method that everybody will be working on uh, going forward. So that's why I'm particularly excited about this. Another implication that is really exciting also is that we see clear evidence for core nuclear burning in this exoplanet, which is remarkable. We don't often think of exoplanets as burning hydrogen in their cores, but this one does. So this is a little bit complicated plot, but bear with me. This is a plot showing luminosity of objects on this axis as a function of their mass. And you can kind of think of things on the right side of this red bar as being things that we might call brown dwarfs, things on the left being things we might call planets. And the transition is sort of around 13 Jupiter masses or so. And this new planet we have discovered, C, lies right on the border between what we might call a brown dwarf and an exoplanet. Now it's peculiar that the brightness of this C is actually very comparable to its much more massive outer companion B. They're fairly similar brightness. So how could this be with such different masses? The only way to account for the enhanced brightness of this planet C is if we, if we incorporate some core nuclear burning into our models. So there's clear evidence that this is burning deuterium actually in its core. And this is a particularly interesting object because objects like this may help us better to refine what we call an exoplanet and what we call a brown dwarf. This is a huge debate in my community. The last implication I wanna mention that I'm also excited about in the direct imaging game at the beginning of my talk, I told you that, that we're only measuring, we're only sensitive to planets on these massive orbits comparable to our own Neptune and our own Pluto. But this discovery really demonstrates that we're now able to directly image and characterize exoplanets truly on solar system scales. This planet that we've discovered is only at three and a half AU. That's between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter in our own solar system. And we know from the radio velocity studies as shown by this complicated plot here, that there's a peak, a pile up of planets at about three astronomical units shown by this bump here. So we know where the planets reside from the radial velocity studies, and now we can go after them with the direct imaging game and characterize them. So that is particularly exciting. So to summarize, 
HD206893 is likely the first directly imaged Gaia exoplanet. This is truly a breakthrough in my field. This object is also clearly undergoing core nuclear burning, which is peculiar and interesting. And the direct imaging game is starting to detect planets, truly planets on solar system scales and not just detect them, but now we can characterize them and say something about their luminosities, their gravities, their compositions, their temperatures. And this is how we're gonna ultimately say something powerful about planet formation. So here's my contact information. You feel free to email me. And we're actually uh, just releasing a press release on this through Exeter University. I was hoping to include a link in this slide, but I'll make sure that it's in the slide deck that I circulate to the AAS officers. So with that, I'll close and take any questions. Thank you. Okay. All right, we'll take questions. Hi there, uh, Adam Mann, uh, freelance. Uh, my question is for Patrick. I'm just wondering, because we saw these really cool images with the 700 watts, um, like what kind of resolution would you expect with the 500 kilowatt uh, instrument? And then also like, what would you see in cis lunar orbit exactly? Or like, would you be able to actually identify specific there was that rocket that crashed into the moon. We couldn't tell where it was. I'm just wondering if it would be able to, uh, you know, help us with something like that. Yeah. So with the, can you hear me? Okay. With the resolution, uh, it's more driven by the the bandwidth of the signal that you send out. So the high power system would probably have a a few times higher bandwidth. So it could probably still be in the the sub meter range. It's not as controlled as much by the, the peak power that you're sending out. The, the increased transmitted power is really going to help you with the sensitivity. So it's it's great if you can do high resolution, but you need to have the, the return power coming back to actually make use of that resolution. So that's where you need the, the higher transmitted power from. And for the, the space debris idea, um, I'll also refer you, I had a poster yesterday in one, it was 104.11. Uh, it had more information about characterization of space debris. So we were able to do some basic characterization of a, a satellite in a high Earth orbit. So there is the opportunity to uh, monitor, track, or even characterize uh, debris or, or satellites in, in cislunar space. Hi, I'm Zili Shen from Astrobytes, and I have a question for Rob Zellum. So uh, if people want to submit their targets to ExoWatch, what are the observational constraints? Like, is there a magnitude limit, and what's the area of sky that you can cover? Uh, right now, we have users across the entire world. Uh, mostly, you have folks in the Northern Hemisphere. So if you have friends in the Southern Hemisphere, we'd love to get you more involved and to get more worldwide coverage. That'd be great. And then for magnitude limits, it's kind of hard to say because if the larger the telescope you have, typically you can achieve uh, dimmer objects. Um, sort of our little niche right now is probably 10th, 11th, 12th magnitude stars in the V-band. And that's actually really well suited for the targets that are likely to be observed by James Webb and Ariel. So we're actually really well suited to actually do really impactful science and observe the same targets that will be observed by James Webb and Hubble and Ariel. Thanks, question for Patrick Martin Wright for Freelance and Evans and so on. Um, so your image is just stunning, jaw dropping. And um, Apollo 15 landing site has a lot of uh, regolith turnover due to the rover. And also the lander is pretty large on the meter scale. Uh, do you have any detection of that? So with, with these images, uh, the raw versions of them would be of order billions of pixels. So it's really hard to, to display that on a, on a monitor. Uh, what happens when you zoom in really closely to actually pixel scale is uh, with this low power system, it tends to be very speckly, sort of like the static on your television. And it's hard to pick out what exactly may be real versus noise at that level. But you can still see great detail when you kind of zoom out a little bit. So don't have any clear detections yet, but 
that would certainly be something interesting to be able to do with a higher power system where you can beat down that noise at the pixel level. Hi, uh, Corey Powell, freelance. Um, two quick questions, if I may. Uh, Patrick, following up, um, I'm obviously curious how these capabilities complement or go beyond uh, what we lost with, with Arecibo. Um, and then a, a question for Emily. Um, I know JWST is focusing on the TRAPPIST-1 system. Uh, TOI-700 is more distant, but it looks like it might actually be a brighter target. And I was wondering what the prospects are for, for JWST studies there. So uh, obviously it's very hard to replace a 305 meter <laughs> radar system with a megawatt of output power, but uh, obviously next best, best thing, you go to the 100 meter fully steerable telescope that's highly capable. Uh, so it, there is uh, a, certainly a difference in the size of the telescope, Sarasibo versus Green Bank and the VLBA, but it will be a very capable system. It'll if we could eventually combine this with the NGVLA, the next generation very large array, that would be a way that we could really push uh, sensitivity to the Arecibo levels. And regarding JWST, um, so TOI 700 is significantly brighter than TRAPPIST, but it's also a bigger star. So if the goal is to measure planet atmospheres, especially for the small planets, it would be a challenging observation that I think would require more hours of time than attack would likely give us. Um, Gilbert Schilling, freelance from the Netherlands, also for Patrick. Something tells me that with radar, there is not a one-to-one -one relation between distance and resolution. Can you go into that? Is that do we, can you expect a very high resolution for more distant solar system objects? And also, why is it that your pictures are so much sharper than the sort of blurry asteroid pictures we have seen from the Arecibo radar. So the radar is, it's inherently kind of fuzzy, fuzzy like that. If you, if you've seen the images from the, the radar images confirming the dart impact, they were very pixelated. So that's obviously much smaller objects than the moon, much further away. So you're dealing with very little signal. So uh, it tends to be very sort of discrete and pixelated like that. You've got, you're only able to put so many sort of resolution cells on a small object compared to something like the moon. So, um, so it, it is a combination of the distance to the object and the size of the object that will determine uh, what resolution is most useful to get science out of it. Um, if you have a very small object very far away, you can still do high resolution because your pixel scale is closer to the size of the object, if that helps. That's certainly something of interest. Uh, one of our team members, one of his goals is he really wants to be able to do radar imaging of the Galilean moon. So that's going to be something we'll see if we can accomplish with the system. Hi, Jeff House of Space News. For Patrick, just to follow up on an earlier question, how does this uh, radar compare to the uh, radar that's operating at Goldstone? So you're looking at, uh, this would be, a, if we can do a 500 kilowatt radar, that would be similar in, in total power as the Goldstone system, uh, but it would be at a different frequency. So Goldstone has a couple different radars, but they're at uh, 7.2 and about 8.6 gigahertz. We're looking at a different band. We're going looking at all the way up to 13.7 gigahertz. That's something that hasn't really been done for planetary scale radars. So in that sense, it's certainly, a, it would be a complement to the Goldstone system. Um, so right now I'd say the system would be sort of comparable to the, the Goldstone system. Essentially they've got a 70 meter dish that can both transmit and receive while we have 
a hundred meter dish transmitting with several twenty five uh, yeah several twenty five meter dishes receiving. So it sort of balances out uh, in the end, at least rough order of magnitude at this point. Uh, hi there, this is Ethan Siegel of Starts with a Bang and the kilt wearer mentioned earlier by Rob. Um, but I'm sorry, Rob, both of my questions are for Emily. Uh, Emily, uh, radius is nice, but do you have prospects for using radial velocity measurements, particularly when you already know the periods of these planets and that they're orbiting edge on to us to obtain the masses of each planet orbiting the star? That's the first one. Go ahead. Yeah, I actually have a campaign on Espresso, which is a high resolution spectrograph based on the very large telescope that Sasha talked about a bit in his talk. Uh, so I've been awarded 100 hours on Espresso over the course of two semesters. Uh, I literally just got data this morning. I got a nice little email every time they take an observation. Uh, so that analysis is underway and I should hopefully have masses for you soon. Awesome. Uh, my second question is a little more out there. Are the orbits of these now four planets exhibiting any resonant behavior as far as their orbits go? And if so, does that have implication for a potential fifth planet out farther than Toy 700D that might be smack in the middle of the habitable zone instead of towards the inner edge? Right. So I believe E and D are close to a four to three mean motion resonance. Um, we haven't seen evidence of significant TTVs in the system, so there's nothing that is obviously pointing to a very large dynamical perturber in the system. Um, one thing that's really exciting about TI-700 is that the next set of test observations begins in eight days. Uh, so certainly we get nine more sectors of observations with tests, and it'll definitely be something worth looking into there. Uh, let's take one question from online. All right, I've got a question here for also for Emily from Bill Waller of the Galactic Inquirer. Why does the transit light curve of TOI 700D look asymmetric? Uh, planet D or planet E? Planet D, yeah. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. It might just be a binning issue. We, we didn't notice anything particularly asymmetric about it in our model, um, but I would definitely have to go back and look at the data a little more closely to see if there's anything strange going on in there. Okay. So. Hi, Liz Landau from NASA. Uh, this question is for Sasha. Hey, Sasha. Uh, I was very intrigued by your result. And I wondered, first of all, um, if there's core nuclear burning, what is the difference between this planet and a super, super low mass star? And then second of all, could JWST follow up on these Gaia exoplanets? Thanks. Yeah, hey, Liz, good to hear your voice. Um, that's a great question. There's a huge debate in our community about what we call a planet and what we call a brown dwarf. The IAU definition puts the boundary at sort of 13 Jupiter masses, and people are very, have strong feelings about this either way. Um, but we, I really feel that this is uh, on a planetary like orbit. It's at three and a half AU, it's below the deuterium burning limit, even though it burns deuterium. So this is going to be a particularly interesting uh, object for us to sort of have this flesh out this debate and and not only sort of ask the question uh, where does this deuterium burning actually switch on but actually how does this sort of relate to what we call a, a brown dwarf or a planet regarding jwst observations of this yes actually this system has already been observed with jwst not in sort of classical coronography mode, but in an amazing mode that some people in this room might be aware of called aperture masking interferometry. It's very familiar to radio astronomers, where you basically take the pupil of James Webb of your $10 billion NASA flagship mission, and you block out 95% of the incoming photons uh, mm -hmm. to actually create a little array of interferometers on the primary mirror, if you will. So uh, Jens Kammerer at Space Telescope and Tomasz Stolker in Europe have, a, have some observations already. They're working hard to try to detect this planet. And this is going to be really remarkable because we can, James Webb is sensitive around 3.3 to 5 microns. And so we can actually sample uh, the spectral energy distribution, the light profile, if you will, of this object from 3 to 5 microns. And with the ground, we can then sample it at 1 to 2 microns. So we can really map out the, the full energy range of this object. And that's really important because, as I mentioned, we got a very precise dynamical mass. 
And if we have a very precise dynamical mass from the ground combined with a very precise luminosity, now we're talking. Now we can say something about constraining evolutionary models of these planets better than we've ever been able to do. So that's going to be a major focus of this field going forward, especially using JWST. Any other questions from the room? Thanks. Uh, a follow-up question for Sasha. Uh, the coming deluge from Gaia, um, can you sort of give us an indication of what that's going to look like? Are we going to basically be like moving moving down the uh, <clears throat> moving down the HR diagram? Or is it going to start with high mass stars and then you're going to, you know, as you collect more and more data, you'll get to to later and later stellar types. Like what are what are we going to be seeing as the as the Gaia data come up, come in and we actually get to see those those astrometric readings coming in? We're just starting to get glimpses of those now. And actually the Gaia mission hasn't been going long enough so that we can actually see stars on the sky doing these full sort of orbit wobbles. But what we now are able to do is we look for anomalies in the motion of the star as it moves across the sky. So when a planet is orbiting a star, uh, it would go like this, but it turns out stars move across the sky. So stars with a planet around them sort of have a a spiral shape as they go across the sky. And we look for that hallmark signature where we actually look for anomalies in the motion across the sky. Uh, and that's what we're starting to see now. And it's exactly that anomaly that allowed us to identify this star with a planet. So this is a long way of saying it's going to take a little while. There's not going to be one day where all the data comes down and we'll have thousands of planets land in our lap. We're, it's actually going to take quite a bit of work and analysis to understand which of these stars we actually can map out a full orbit and which just sort of show a proper motion anomaly as they move across the sky. Nonetheless, there's going to be hundreds of planets that Gaia returns, probably thousands, and many of these are going to be close enough, bright enough, and young enough that we can directly image using ground-based telescopes like we have done in Chile, but also, as Liz Landau hinted at, we can do this with James Webb, and I think we know how to do that. Do you have any other online questions? Um, yeah, we have another question here for Patrick from Megan Bartles from space.com. So this is kind of similar along the same lines as the question we had earlier about comparing the abilities of Arecibo and GBT. So specifically in terms of how distant of asteroids you can observe, how do the test system and the goal or ideal radar capabilities compare to Arecibo? So just for order of magnitude, if you can take the prototype system and multiply it by a factor of a thousand that gets you a little more than a factor of five in distance. And that translates to a factor of more than a hundred in volume that you can search. So that's a significant increase in what you can, the, uh, the amount of space accessible to the system. Uh, to compare that to Arecibo, another key thing is Arecibo was very limited in its field of view of around the zenith. Green Bank is much more maneuverable. It can see, uh, I forget the exact number, but something like 80% of the sky where Arecibo is more like a third. So while it may not have the same sensitivity as Arecibo at this point, it does have uh, more flexibility and, and it's how you can maneuver the and observe different uh, objects. Great, thank you. Great, any last questions? All right, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank our speakers again. Uh, also, all the PIOs who helped uh, with their releases and our sponsor for the AAS press office, uh, the USRA. So their next press conference will be this afternoon at 2.15, and thank you for all coming.